The coronavirus has been described as the biggest challenge the world has faced since the Second World War. Yet, while all eyes are on this devastating pandemic, deforestation and fires in the Amazon forest may turn out a new planetary emergency in 2020. In this episode, we will focus on deforestation and the looming risk of large-scale destruction in the Amazon and elsewhere. Something we also know is linked to several health problems, including the spread of infectious disease from animals to humans, like COVID-19. My name is Fredrik Mubey, and together with Ana Paula Aguiar from the Brazilian Institute for Space Research and David Armstrong McKay from the Stockholm Resilience Center, we will try to find answers to questions like how worried should we all be and what can we do about it? Welcome to Rethink Talks. Hi, it's Hi. great to have you here. Uh, I have David here with me in the studio in Stockholm and Ana Paula from Brazil. Really nice to have you here. Looking forward to this talk uh, about tipping points and forests and the future of everything, basically. Mm -hmm. It's going to be interesting. But for people who don't know you, could you just briefly introduce yourselves? Let's go with David first. Yeah, so I'm David, uh, Dr. David Armstrong Mackay. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at Stockholm Resilience Center. And my research is about feedbacks and tipping points in the Earth system, like the linkages between climate, between biosphere and with human societies as well, both in the past and the future. Yeah, thanks. Great to have you here. Again. Thank you. And Ana Paula from Brazil. Where are you in Brazil? I am in uh, São José dos Campos, uh, that's a city close to São Paulo. Uh, I work at the Brazilian Institute for Space Research. I'm a researcher here. Um, I work with uh, deforestation and modeling and scenarios. Uh, I'm also affiliated to SRC, where I work with uh, scenarios uh, and participatory process related to sustainability futures. So that's it. Great, mm -hmm. thanks. And we will come back to all this later on in the discussions, of course, what a tipping yeah. point is and what you actually do when you do your research. So, mm -hmm. but just briefly, so how come you are scientists in your particular field? What, what's, what sort of drives you and what made you become a scientist in that field? Mm. David, start with you. Yeah, so I started out as a geophysics student back in the UK. Uh, but through my undergrad, I became more and more fascinated with Earth system science sort of the science of how the Earth, all the different parts, the oceans, the geology, the atmosphere, how they all interact. In particular, how the biosphere, the living parts, interact with that. Uh, and also with my concern about climate change in the modern day, uh, this led me to a PhD on um, looking at what drove climate events in the last 66 million years. Um, so that's what got me into it. And nowadays I, I study that by looking at climate biosphere tipping points and feedbacks. Um, and yeah, the, the thing I find really fascinating and what drives me in all this is I'm really interested in how the Earth and life have come to co-evolve over billions of years and then how we, the emergence of human societies and cultures, how that takes part in that now as well and what that means about how we should uh, behave in the future if we're part of this big, complex, interlinked system. Oh, that's extremely interesting. What can we learn from events that occurred like 50 million years ago. Mm. We will get back to that soon, yeah. definitely. So, Ana Paula, what drives you? How come you're a scientist in your field? Yeah, well, it's a long story, but make it short. I have a very uh, technical background. I am a computer scientist, and I did my master's and, uh, and PhD in remote sensing. And, uh, and then I started working with the Amazon and deforestation and modeling. And uh, I, I kind of asked myself how I could be more useful. Uh, and, and I realized that working with scenarios and as I am trained as a system analyst, I am good at bridging people and bridging different disciplines. So I started to really dedicate to this building scenarios and what drives me bottom line is really to decrease human suffering and environmental harm and i try to like 
bring this to the work that I do with these scenarios to sustainable futures. Oh, interesting. Thanks. And we'll definitely come back to that, how we can sort of mm -hmm. try to uh, navigate and have a secure future for everybody on the planet, including the planet mm -hmm. itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a yeah. challenge. So uh, we're going to focus on forests today. Mm -hmm. I know, David, you worked with other kind of tipping points as well, and they interact when we come back to that, of course. But first, just focus on the Amazon and the huge rainforest there. And this is definitely your home turf, uh, Anna Paula. And just the first a question, why, why is the Amazon such an important ecosystem? Well, it's uh, the largest uh, remaining uh, rainforest in the, in the world. It's super rich in terms of biodiversity. Um, and uh, it's very important for the climate for two reasons. Uh, one is that it stores a lot of carbon and when it's deforested and burned, it uh, releases a lot of uh, CO2 to the atmosphere, influencing the climate negatively. But it's also important through the, the water cycle to the regional climate. And uh, in fact, your recent research has shown that uh, rain in other parts of Brazil depend on Amazon. And it, and it also, so it's important for agriculture, it's important for everything, for water supply, but it is important on itself. It's beautiful, it's alive. Hmm. It's the trees, the birds and everything, and the people. It, it has indigenous people. It's not empty at all. It has indigenous people, it has traditional population. It has a population of 24 million people now, wow. mostly living in urban areas. So it's very complex. So it's, it's, and and people that work there fall in love. Hmm. So this is like, a, I mean, we often talk in ecology about keystone species. This is like a keystone ecosystem for the whole planet's exactly. climate stability and for yeah. water fed agriculture in other countries as well. Mm -hmm. And for biodiversity, exactly. it's such an important ecosystem. And a lot of things happened last year in 2019. Uh, mm -hmm. Could you just briefly describe the situation last year? Yeah, last year, uh, deforestation uh, peaked. We had a peak of deforestation of 10,000 square kilometers. It was a decade peak, it, which of course is not as bad as it was in the beginning of the century that we, yeah, but, but it's, it's uh, worrisome. Uh, and uh, and the trend, well, and and then there was these forest fires in in August, also in par partly related to the deforestation, um, yeah. And uh, and then it, it, what the problem is that after that, uh, after the dry season, the dry season in the Amazon starts in May and goes uh, until October, but deforestation did not decrease. In, in the even during the winter time, the winter months. So that's it. Mm. And what about the situation today? I mean, we had a long period of seeing some positive trends in the Amazon compared to the beginning yeah. of the century or two, early 2000s. Yeah. And then we have had this negative trend again. And what's happening right now? We are very concerned there was some change in the governance of the situation. Um, uh, now, since the beginning of the year, uh, the, the, there is this, uh, the vice president is personally in charge by uh, what they, they created a council of the Amazon. Uh, the arm uh, is there now in, in field operations of command and control, but it's still, it is very high. The, the deforestation rates. And I checked the for the fire the, the hotspots of fires uh in this month and it's higher than than last year at the same time. So it, it's like if you have two different uh forces that there is a, a hope of like controlling this but there is also the, this process that was coming from the last year of 
returning the deforestation. And uh, so we, we really don't know. Uh, we are doing our best, but don't know. So there are a lot of more fires to expect this season. It will probably be worse than 2019. Is that your what you're saying? Uh, of course, yes. it's hard to know, but the... it's, a, it's, a, it's hard to know. I, I, I think that uh, for sure the deforestation rate for 2020 is going to be higher than 2019 because we measure it from uh, August one year to July the last the next year. So the the rate that's going to be measured this year is certainly going to be higher than this 10,000 kilometers of last year because it has it was kept it very high. But we have hope of trying to control the process in the last months and then we may have less fires and but it it's very open. We don't know. And the combination, of course, of deforestation and climate change, David, uh, there's a fear of a tipping point mm -hmm. that the forest will turn into something else like a dry savanna with less of all these values that Ana Paula was talking about. So what is a tipping point, really? This is your turf. Yeah. yeah so if we start from scratch, uh, most natural systems, if you push them, they, gra they change very gradually. Um, but sometimes some of these systems can have a threshold beyond which you can get a really sudden or irreversible change. Even if you just have a tiny change over that threshold, it can turn into a really big one. Uh, and to explain how it works, you can think of a tipping point as being a bit like a seesaw. So you have the pivot in the middle and the plank, and imagine you're pushing a ball up the slope. And if you push the ball up the slope but let it go before the pivot, it will roll back. You know, It's still under control. Whereas once you push the ball past the pivot, then it will just keep on rolling even if you stop pushing it. And that's a bit like one of these thresholds and a tipping point that once you get past it, it becomes self-perpetuating. And um, the thing that drives this often in nature is what we call a positive feedback loop, uh, which is a bit like a vicious cycle where the, the process itself kind of feeds back on itself and makes itself bigger. So even a very small change can become very big. And uh, the best example um, of this is the Arctic sea ice. So Arctic sea ice is very white, it's very bright, it reflects energy back to space. Uh, but global warming is causing it to retreat, which is exposing the darker blue ocean underneath, and that absorbs a lot more uh, solar radiation. So it warms itself up. The ice itself kind of is self-cooling, but as we lose it, you lose that self-cooling, it amplifies local warming, and that means you lose even more sea ice. So you get one of these vicious cycles, positive feedback loop, uh, and once it gets to a certain threshold, then the entire sea ice will be lost uh, irreversibly. Maybe not immediately, but it will be inevitable that you lose it. So then if it sort of goes across this threshold, it would be much more to clean up the mess afterwards. It's mm. better to be proactive than reactive. Exactly. And sometimes you also hear this sort of expression about the straw that broke the camel's back. Yeah. It's like a popular way of, sorry, of metaphor to describe exactly, what's happening. Yeah. And I mean, you have, this is so fascinating. You have actually studied some tipping points far back in geological history. Yeah. For instance, one that happened like 56 million years ago, mm -hmm. where temperature also rose like five to eight degrees or something on the mm. planet on average. What happened then? And so, what, can, what can we learn from that? So yeah, uh, that's the, it's called the Paleocene Eocene Thermal Maximum, uh, or the PTM for short. And about 55, 56 million years ago, we reckon that uh, there was a big volcanic eruption, roughly where at Iceland is now, when that was actually closed and before the Atlantic opened there, um, there was a huge eruption, what we call the large igneous province. And this is like, it dwarfs any volcanic eruption we've seen today. Um, but that eruption happened through coal fields. So in a way, it acts as kind of like a, an analogue for current climate change because it was um, the burning and release of carbon from coal fields going into the atmosphere. And it caused about five degrees, at least, of global warming, which is roughly what we're looking at for if we burn as much as carbon as we can this century, we'll get about five degrees or more warming. Uh, but that really, so that makes it kind of like an analog for current climate change. But the thing that makes it different is that what we're doing now is about 10 times faster than what happened in that case. And we, we had a minor extinction event at that point. So that make, that's what makes it concerning that the nearest natural analog we have was bad, but we're doing it faster. But how tipping points come in is that there, there are various different reservoirs of carbon, apart from the coal, 
that we reckon started releasing carbon as well. Once the warming got to a certain level, you get this feedback from uh, methane that's frozen into the seabed that we call methane hydrates might have started leaking out and boosting the global warming effect. And methane is an even sort of more potent yeah. greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. Exactly, yeah. And forest tipping points in all this, why are, why are they so important? I so, mean, we heard that Amazon, of course, stores a yeah. lot of carbon, but other forests, are they also having tipping points? The boreal forest where we are in Stockholm, Sweden, do they have tipping points as well? Yeah, so quite a lot of rainforests do. Not all of them. The Congo seems to be a little more stable than the Amazon. Um, but a lot of rainforests have tipping points, and the boreal forest, as you say, are the forest that goes around the Arctic Circle, um, that has is hypothesized to have tipping points as well. Uh, and the key thing is the interaction of rainfall and fire. Um, so as Anna Paula mentioned, um, the Amazon recycles a lot of its own rainfall. Uh, something like a third of its rainfall is made by itself. So you get uh, moisture being blown in off the Atlantic, and then it gets recycled, sometimes up to six times per water molecule. Um, so it's making part of its own rain. But that means if we have, if we deforest at the edges of the Amazon, especially in the south and the east, uh, or you just get a drought killing off areas of rainforest, that means it's, it's making less rain. So rainforest further inland is getting less water. So that's more likely to dry out. You're more likely to get wildfires that knock it out. And that means you can have parts of the rainforest can be either two states with the same amount of rainfall. You can get either the rainforest, which then recycles the rain, or past the tipping point, you actually get a uh, grassy savanna. Uh, so a bit more kind of like um, elsewhere in Brazil, you have the Cerrado. Uh, but it's also kind of, you can imagine it a bit like the Serengeti. So there are trees, but it is mostly grassland. And that stores a lot less carbon. Uh, and in the process of dying back, that carbon gets released to the atmosphere. Something about five years worth of human uh, carbon dioxide emissions. Wow. So really important to try to avoid these large scale tipping points in the Amazon then. Yeah. So and this sort of uh, moisture feedback thing is one of these positive sort of feedback loops that are in more general terms a negative one. Yes. But this is what we scientists exactly. call the positive feedback loop. It's more understandable <laughs> if you think of it as a vicious cycle. A vicious cycle. Yeah. yeah. That's a better one. All right. Uh, and going back to the Amazon, Anna Paula, uh, the million dollar question, how do we change things in the Amazon? How do we conserve them and sustainably use the resources there? I think that um, knowledge is really important. Uh, and I want to make two points. One is that, for instance, we need to understand what are the causes and processes that lead to forest fires, to wildfires, and what are the processes and because we have two problems, we have the forest fires and we have the deforestation, clear cut deforestation. Both has have fires associated, and we need to address these two things. And and the same the same way when we are talking about deforestation, you have multiple processes around that. I made an analysis of uh, what happened in 2019. So around 44% of that uh, happened in areas of uh, not private property, but of farms. Uh, we don't know if they are really properties, but people that have uh, declared that they, are, they, are a, they have a farm. In these areas, uh, very, we made some analysis, very few people really produce something there. So there is a lot of problem, a, a, a very he, he, important problem to be addressed of land grabbing, grabbing uh, uh, public land. And this needs to be addressed. Then you have the people that are really farms, serious farms, that you can uh, act on them through the market chains. So there is no silver bullet. There is a lot of deforestation around 55% happening in public settlements. Um, why is this happening? We need to understand. And there is a lot of deforestation happening in protected areas and indigenous lands. So I think that looking at the problem with data and trying to understand, and the most important thing is 
Brazil has proven that it is possible. We have decreased the deforestation from 27,000 kilometers to 5,000 kilometers during a lot, lot, several years. It's possible. It's political will, basically. Hmm. David, anything to sort of add? Yeah. Yes. So from a, at least from a tipping points perspective, I would say that it's still it is still possible to save the Amazon. Sometimes people say the tipping point might have already happened and that you know, it'll be irreversible dieback. But I think it's it's not quite that clear cut. Uh, pun, pun intended. Pun, pun not intended, yeah. <laughs> um, so it's sometimes said that uh, once deforestation goes above 20%, uh, that's when the risk of uh, Amazon dieback grows. And at the moment, we're sort of 17 18%. So it's quite close. It's too close for comfort. But it's worth bearing in mind that that 20% is actually a precautionary boundary. We don't actually know how much deforestation actually will cause a dieback. And it also matters where it happens. Some areas are more sensitive to this feedback process than other areas. So I'd say there's still, there's still time to stop a big dieback process. Um, as long as emissions, carbon emissions around the world, go down quick enough. And if deforestation is brought right back down, then there's still a chance to stop this wide-scale dieback. So we mm. need to make sure that global warming is not continuing as well, because then the threshold will be even lower, right? Exactly. So the 20 to 25 percent of uh, deforestation threshold is mm. depending on uh, a climate that is not a runaway climate change, at least. Yeah. 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 So um, we could stop deforestation now, but if global warming keeps on happening, somewhere around at least somewhere around three or four degrees, perhaps, comes out in models as when you might get this dieback process anyway, even if we stop deforestation. So it's both. We have to stop emissions and uh, stop deforestation as well, as quick as we can. A challenge indeed. And we also, of mm -hmm. course, have the situation now with the pandemic. And it's, of course, negative in so many different ways. And also for people living in the Amazon, the indigenous people there. But can you see any sort of hope in this, uh, a possibility in the situation as well. I mean, from resilience theory perspective, we sometimes talk about crisis mm. as an opportunity. Do you see anything like that, Dave? Yeah, so it's certainly a difficult time. So especially in some of these, um, in the Amazon rainforest and other rainforests, there are a lot of indigenous peoples who have very little immunity for something like coronavirus. So it's a particularly difficult time for them. But also it's stretching the capacity of all the governments across these, both the uh, tropical rainforests and the boreal forests to try and manage and monitor these problems with deforestation and wildfires. Um, but there is now, there is a growing movement as part of the sort of thinking about how to recover from this pandemic, this uh, rallying around the uh, build back better uh, as a way of trying to make sure that when the economy starts rebounding, that we build in uh, green economic recovery um, processes so that uh, we can center things like human well-being and justice, uh, reducing emissions and deforest getting deforestation back down to zero. If those are centered in any sort of economic recovery, then there's actually a possibility that we can try and build back better. And it's even possible, it's been suggested that because of the dip in carbon emissions this year, if we build back better and have a green economic recovery, we could actually make this the first year of many when carbon emissions start continuously falling, which is something we've not actually ever managed before. And how much, uh, I mean, there's been different projections, but what's the lo latest number you've heard about how much carbon dioxide might drop this year? It might only be a few percent. So back in um, February or March, it was like a 17% global drop. Um, which was huge. You know, we haven't seen that even during past crises and wars in the 20th century. We've never seen a drop that big. By the end of the year, it will be like a few percent. But even that's good because we've never we've never managed to drop it for more than a few years in a row. So if there's a drop this year, but then the recovery options we build in keep that drop going, then we might actually have a chance of uh, bringing emissions down by 2030. It's, that's when we should be getting emissions down by 50%. Uh, in order to have a chance at 1.5 degrees. Mm. And we definitely need to find other reasons for <laughs> decreasing our emissions than the pandemic, of course. Exactly. Anna Paula, do you see any opportunities in this crisis? Yeah, I, I, depending on the days, certain days I'm not so optimistic, but uh, what, I, what I think is that this pandemic has exposed uh, how unequal we are um, 
and if this understanding um, kind of gets incorporated and people uh, yeah change because of that it it has it has shown how people different people have uh, the different the, the, the death too for black people for instance and poor people is a lot higher in places like Brazil so I, what I have hope is that if you, we can um, join this sustainability and equity uh, as one flag uh, and people and I, I do I do uh, get optimist when I see the, like movements like the Fridays for Future and this Black Lives Matter. I think that we can we can change things if people realize that we really need change and uh, we have to fight for a sustainable and just world. Mm -hmm. Much of the harm we are seeing is because of in inequality in power and everything so that's what i think so let's hope for a social tipping point mm -hmm. so we don't have to go through all these other ecological and earth science tipping points then yeah exactly thanks for that we time is running out try to if you can to summarize in one sentence the take-home message that you would like everybody who has listened today to have after this uh, episode david what would be your take home message? Yeah, so my take home message would be that there might well be levels of a level of global warming and deforestation beyond which large parts of the Amazon rainforest could die back. But, and it's an important caveat, we're not there yet. If we reduce emissions fast enough and stop deforestation soon, there's still a chance to avoid this tipping point. It's not yet inevitable. Thanks. Anna Paula. Mine is that um, I had a teacher who used it to say, coach is someone that I don't know, that there are no technical solutions for political problems. And uh, in relation to this stopping deforestation and all these problems, is that there is no single solution for complex problems. We need to understand and address each angle of it, and we can win. It needs, requires political will. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Really like that. And then, mm -hmm. as a sort of uh, even more final question, I will ask you to this has been like a segment that we want to include in each of these podcasts some book recommendations. I mean, this is such a huge topic tipping points, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the Amazon, all the things that we talked about, Jay. Or is there like any book you should read if you want to dig deeper into this? What would be your recommendation, David? Yeah, so I've not had as much time recently to read as I would like. You would have thought in, in this situation I'd be doing lots of reading, but lots of work to do. Uh, but some of the best um, environmental books I read last year, kind of more general to do with climate rather than specific on the Amazon or tipping points. Uh, one of them was uh, The Great Derangement by Amitav Ghosh. Uh, and that sort of, that's a really interesting look at how the collective imagination of global society sort of failing uh, understanding the scale and magnitude of climate change. Another really good book I read was um, The Mushroom at the End of the World by Anna Singh. And that was that's a really good look at how the, looking around the human ecology of the Matsutake uh, fungus uh, and sort of using that as a prism to look at uh, how global capitalism reaches around the world and uh, sort of how we can build sort of new ways of living in the ruins of the old. Um, and a couple of books I'm interested in reading soon and uh, I've heard good things about are Braiding Sweetgrass uh, by Robin uh, Kimmerer and also Tending the Wild by um, Kat Anderson. And these are two books about uh, indigenous ecological knowledge in the Americas from before colonization uh, and how they relate and interact with scientific knowledge. Anna Paula, do you have anything more that I should put on my reading list? Yeah, I, I think that if you want to understand about the Amazon, it's, it's very important to read about the history of what is there. Sometimes people look at deforestation, for instance, and, and think that like only market solutions like boycotting and things uh, can solve the problem. And, and it's so complex because it has all this history of conflict and violence. So there is a two two women that I think that are uh, 
essential. One is Marianne Chimin, that's anthropologist from um, University of Florida. She has this very uh, uh, classic book called The Contested Frontiers in Amazon from 92. And the other one is geographer uh, Berta Becker that has many books, including one that's Amazonia that tells the whole story. And I think that's very important. There is also the biography of Marechal Rondon. Um, that's a military uh, and it's uh, a lot about the indigenous people and protection. So, so I think that, that's it. Thanks Maybe. a lot to both of you. It's mm -hmm. been a pleasure mm -hmm. talking to you and great to have you on the link from Brazil, Ana Paula. Thanks yeah, a million. Yeah, yeah. I thank you so much. It was yeah, hope, hope to see you hope to see you soon in Stockholm mm -hmm. and thanks David for being here to, mm -hmm. today. Yeah, Just thanks to very much here. for having me. Thanks. You have listened to Rethink Talks, a podcast series produced by the Stockholm Resilience Center at Stockholm University. For more episodes, head over to our website, rethink.earth.